Okay, so for those who are online, uh, welcome. Uh, this is fairly interactive today, so we're going to try and involve you as well. So Dylan has made the, the, the sheet that we're going to work through available for a download in a, in a link. So just check the, is it in the chat or somewhere? In the chat, there's a link where you can actually also download uh, the diagram and the two sheets. Um, so if you can, uh, you can hopefully try and follow along at, at, at home as well. All right. So does everybody have a sheet like this, a diagram like this? Yeah. yeah. Anybody who does not have a diagram like this? One like this, All right? And then there's one with blocks A, B, C, D, called the Spiritual Types Inventory, right? And you should also have one called Scoring Guide. You don't have the Scoring Guide. That one? Yeah. No, it's uh, in uh, in American English, I think. Oh, so it's in American. Not yeah. All right. Okay, you can uh, put that away for a moment. We'll we'll, we'll get back to these sheets uh, pretty soon. Lisa and myself went to the European Teacher Conference in Tallinn in Estonia. Uh, two weekends ago, yeah, two weekends ago, um, from started the Thursday evening and ran through the whole of Friday, whole of Saturday, and the evenings and uh, Sunday morning, and then finished off with a with a, a joint service with the Tallinn Church on on Sunday morning. Uh, it was an incredible, incredibly inspiring and encouraging and fulfilling time. It was packed with teaching. Uh, I realized I am not in my 20s anymore or 30s anymore. There's quite a lot to absorb, uh, but uh, it, was, it was really a fantastic time. Um, and in case you don't know, thank you Watford Church for sending us. Uh, normally Malcolm goes, but since he was, uh, he was so, he's so, what's the word, infatuated with a new grandparenting baby thing, uh, I'm sure you could not have missed it in any way. If you're on any kind of social media anywhere, you would have seen probably YouTube videos, Instagrams, Facebooks, uh, WhatsApp groups. If you've been anywhere on digital media, you would have seen photos of little Talia, is it? Talaya, Talaya. Talaya and uh, Malcolm and the proud, proud, proud grandparents. So congratulations to Malcolm and, and Penny. Um, but anyway, so Lisa and myself uh, went in, instead of Malcolm. Uh, there were loads of UK, other UK teachers there as, there as well. Andy Boache was there. Uh, the Izilos from the east were there. Um, Rob Payne from the north. Uh, there's a, was a couple that I don't actually know from Birmingham. Walter and what is wife's name? Um, Ali and Wendy was there from uh, from Edinburgh. Uh, who else? Yeah, from quite a, quite a number of UK teachers teachers from all over Europe and also from other places in the world who, who, who came. Uh, we, we also, next Sunday, Liesl will share some more of myself, a bit more about the content and some, some of our insights and learnings. But uh, one of the classes that we did was about, about uh, spiritual maturity and growing and maturing as a, as a Christian and as a congregation. And when I looked at that, it was a, there was a very practical part of the class that I realized will fit in very well with our current series that uh, Malcolm started uh, two Sundays ago on unity. And that's what we're going to look at uh, today is taking what I learned from that conference and uh, applying it for ourselves here in, in Watford. All right. Um, Oh, Danny told me I did such a great job with uh, heads and shoulders, we're not going to sing this song. So we'll skip that. Thank you, Danny, for the compliment. Um, <coughs> right, so we're in this complete unity series. Uh, Malcolm started uh, two Sundays ago uh, about unity with Jesus in the early church. Quickly, the four key points from that. Jesus prayed for unity in John 17. Uh, Jesus commands unity primarily through love in John 13. Uh, Jesus taught his disciples on unity in Mark 9 and uh, Mark 10. And in the early church, right in from the beginning, uh, had to actively work on their unity. And he looked at the passage in Act 6 as an example there. So that was uh, Jesus in the early church on unity. And today we're going to carry on on that theme. And we're going to look at what I call hands and feet, eyes and ears, which is what connects with our song that we, that we did. 
um, hands and feet, eyes and ears. So I'm going to read this passage from the message translation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14 to 27. I would suggest that you rather listen than try and follow along in some other translation because they are quite different and the, the message is quite unique in that sense that it's uh, kind of a very contemporary common language translation. Um, but I love the way sometimes it speaks to us uh, in, in the way it uses a language. Now I am going to have to either get closer to that screen back there or turn around to this one behind me. Okay, thank you, Amy. Right. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. The context of this scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul addresses the Corinthian church, and there's two things that they were causes, caused disunity in the church in Corinth. The first part of it was about the gifts and the special gifts and the general gifts of the Holy Spirit, which you can go and read about in the first part of 1 Corinthians 12, where some people received gifts of prophecy and some people received gifts of healing and some received gifts of service. And there was disputes between, and disunity in the church because, you know, it's sort of like, oh, I've got this gift and you don't have it. And it wasn't a great situation. That's part of one part of the context. The other part of it is different roles in the church that... God gave the church different leadership roles, like uh, pastors, evangelists, teachers, elders, etc. And there was some disunity and disputes about those roles. So that's kind of the context. So, in general, the context is about unity and disunity in the church. So, in verse 14, he says, I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant. Oh, thank you. Put that back. Now let's hope without my reading glasses. Yeah, I think I'll manage. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It is all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. Now if foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings. I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, limpid, I had to look that up. Limpid is like kind of glistening, translucent, glistening. Uh, limpid and expressive. I don't deserve a place on the head. Would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all I, how could it hear? If it's all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine I telling hand, get lost, I don't need you, or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The, the lower part, the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, because you've got another one, but not without a stomach, because you only have one. When it is a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? No, I don't know. Some... <laughs> so don't follow my eyes about, you know, some people are losing hair, you know? It's like... <laughs> Tough choices. 
But yeah, if you had to choose, you know, what do you prefer? Good digestion, full-bodied hair, mm, you know? I think I prefer my good digestion, thank you. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. All right. Thank you, Leon. You know, it's amazing how, if you think about the song we sang a bit earlier, it actually went quite well. I was quite impressed by all these adults knowing that kids' song and emotions and everything. But what happened when we cut out the feet and the nose? I don't know. It lost its rhythm and people got out of sync and it didn't quite work so well. It's interesting. Um, when uh, one of my children was young, this was when we were living in Namibia. Uh, he was, I don't know, eight, nine years old or something. And he was cutting open a tin of dog food. And you get two kind of tin openers, the one that cuts kind of from the top in, and you get another kind of tin opener that cuts along the edge, along the outside. And then you take the top off and you, you get left with a very sharp edge of the tin can, actually. So he was opening this tin can of dog food, and uh, the lid came off and the, the can slipped out of his hand. And he was barefoot, as we do in Africa, we walk around barefoot, and uh, he was barefoot, the thing slipped fell on his uh, little toe and basically almost completely cut off his little toe. It was kind of just dangling by some little bit of uh, stuff. <laughs> um, so it wasn't completely off, but it was more or less almost cut off. So we rushed into a and &E, and uh, the guy at a and &E was like, ooh, this is not looking good. I don't know if we're going to save this toe. And uh, luckily, or blessedly, um, at that very moment, the orthopedic surgeon who just came off shift walked past, and the guy in A&E says, you know what, I just saw the orthopedic specialist walk past. I'm going to call him to come and have a look. And I the guy came and had a look, and he was like, ooh, yeah, we've got to save this toe. Uh, but I'm not, you know, I can't guarantee that we're going to save this little toe. And me being like an, I don't know, on the one hand, you know, you want the best for your child, but being a bit of a doofus, I'm like, in, uh, it's only a little toe. Does it really matter that much, you know, if he loses it? <laughs> it's like, what a heartless parent. <laughs> but I'm like, a, I'm an engineer, you know, I'm practical. I'm like, okay, let me just, you know, calculate what the importance of this, this, this thing, you know, what's it going to cost to say private health care, you know, this is not the NHS. Um, what's it going to cost to save this little toe? And is it worth it? And you know, maybe it's better to just, okay, you lost the toe. And this orthopedic surgeon says, you know what? Don't underestimate the value of that little toe at the end of your foot. He said, your son will have to actually learn how to walk again and run again because it, it plays an important role in balancing and in walking. He says, you'll be surprised that just losing that little toe, what, what effect it will have on his... Uh, He's playing sport and playing rugby, and, and he's like, oh, does he, does he like sport? And does he like, yeah, he plays cricket, plays rugby. It's like, an, it's not going to be that simple. So we, we have to save it, if, if at all we can. Such a little insignificant thing, which we don't even think about. I mean, when last did you think about your little toe? Except maybe if you bumped it against, against something, you went like, ow, oh yeah, I forgot I had that little thing there. <laughs> but that's what the scripture says, you know, all the parts are important. And God has placed them all in their rightful places. And the one part can't say to the other part, I don't need you. Why? Because things won't work, quite work as well as they're supposed to. So, hands and feet and eyes and ears. Let's do a survey. Oh, that's a little bit small, but okay. So, you have, uh, hopefully you have a pen. If your pen or pencil doesn't work, then uh, we've got a whole box full of old ones here. I can, uh, we can supply you with an alternative. And we're going to do this survey. Uh, so if you grab the page with the A, B, C, D columns that says so spiritual types inventory. Okay, first of all, it's not a test. This is not, there's no right and wrong answers. 
Secondly, this is something called a forced choice inventory. You're basically forced to choose every time between only two options. And you may um and ask, like, well, actually, it's kind of in between. I'm not sure. Don't overthink it. Don't debate it. Pick the one that you think is most relevant. So basically, you choose one of each pair of options. And then the one that what you're looking for is the one that comes closest to the, describing your spiritual preferences or your spiritual life, your spiritual habits. Think about which pattern best describes you and your perception and your interaction with God. Okay, so that's a way to think about it. And if you look at the diagram on the screen there, you can see basically you go down column A and every time there's two options. You choose either the first column or the second column. So they're basically in pairs. And you do that column A, so for A you do, you do the first two, second two, and you basically just choose one of the two and mark the one that you choose. <coughs> then you do B, then you do C, then you do D. All right, is that, um, that more or less clear? Any questions? Clear as mud. It's clear as mud, okay. Why don't you start, and then as you go along, maybe it will get more clear. <laughs> or, and if, if it doesn't, please raise your hand and, and ask. Um, okay, is it clear what the expectation is? You basically go for, you start at the top, A, I prefer to think of God as revealed and knowable, or I prefer to think of God as hidden in mystery. And you choose one of the two. Then you go to the next one. In, in A, section A, I prefer to focus on the similarities that exist between God and God's creatures, or I prefer to focus on the radical differences between God and God's creatures. So you pick one of the two. When you're done with A, you carry on down to B. When you're done with B, you go up to C and then D. All right. All done? Okay, all done. Well done. Um, as we can see already, there's some differences between us. Some don't think twice. They're like, yeah, yeah, this, that. Others like, hmm, I wonder. Hey, I'm not so sure. Hmm, could be this one. Could be that one. I wonder what this means. Anyway, lots of differences already. Let's score it. Um, so, first we start by adding the, the A and B sections. So, down the left-hand side. And if you look at your scoring sheet, at the right at the top, there's two scores for a, section A and section B. The first score, you take the left column of A, everything that you've picked there, and the right-hand column of B. So you add that up, the left column of A, the right column of B, and that goes into your first score. Then, next step, you swap the columns around, you take the second column of A and the first column of B, you add them up, and that goes into your second score. If you need help, just uh, give me a shout. Then when you've done A and B, uh, skip the bit that says if the number in your first blank, we'll come back to that. Then we'll do columns C and D, and then same thing again. Left column of C, right column of D, gives you your third total. And the right column of C and the left column of D gives you your last total. What? You got zero, okay. Ten for the other, okay, interesting. All right, any questions up to this point? All clear how to total up your scores, All right? Then next step, when you've totaled up your scores. Can you not the scores together? No, no, no. When you've got your four scores written down. Okay, let's just see, are we all there? Put up your hand if you've got your four scores written down. Yes, 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 everybody? Yeah, Nana, have you added up? Yeah, you me? Have you got four scores? Not yet, okay. Everyone there, okay. So next step. Now we need to take those scores and decide between a K and an A for the top section, okay? Um, so for the top section, the, the columns A and B, if you have, in your first score, anything between 6 and 11, you've got a K, and then look at the K. If it's 6 or 7, it's K minus. If it's 8 or 9, it's K. If it's 10 or 11, it's K plus. 
If you've got 1 to 5 or 0 to 5, then you don't have a K. Then you will have an A. And then same thing again. For A, if it's 6 or 7, A minus, 8 or 9, A, 10 or 11, A plus. Okay, so you should have either a K or an A, but not both. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. And then the same thing again with M and H. So with M and H, your third score, if it's between uh, 6 and 11, you have an M. And then you just put it as M minus, M or M plus. And if you have between 1 and 5, for your third score, you don't have an M, you will have an H. So if you have a, between 6 and 11 for your final score, then you'll have an H, and then score it as H minus H or H plus. All right. Okay, so what you'll end up with is two letters. Right? You'll be, you'll be something like a, a KM or an AH, right? two letters. Okay, are we all there? Can we move along? I don't want to lose anybody along the way, so let's make sure we're all, all scored up. You should have only two letters. Either a K or an A, and either an M or an H. Okay, so what does this... Uh, what does all this mean? You've got a diagram uh, that I was also handed out. We'll, we'll come back to that... Uh, we'll move on to that just now. But uh, so, what does it mean? So, for example, I scored six five and five six. So I'm a K minus H minus. Let's see. Uh, who else is K H? Okay. Let's do one, two, three, four, five, six. Who is uh, A M? There's one, two, three, four A M's. Who is K M? One, two, three, four, five, six. Who is A H? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, what do you notice? That's quite a variety. Yeah. We've got one of every, and it's almost fairly equally distributed. We are not all the same. We're not all hands, we're not all feet, we're not all eyes, we're not all ears. Very different. Um, even more so, okay, who has a plus? Okay, there's a plus, there's a plus, two pluses, there's another plus, three pluses, another plus, four pluses. Who has a minus? Okay, quite a few minuses. Who's neutral? Not neither plus. Yeah, there's one, two, three, one neutral. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you may be a mix of neutrals and pluses or minus. So again, it's fairly equally distributed. Some pluses, some minuses, some neutrals. So are we all the same? What does it mean? The minuses. Oh, that's the next step. Okay. So clearly, we're not all the same. Okay. That's one thing we can can conclude. We are different. And when it comes to unity in the church, and even between churches, it's, that's an important thing to understand. God made us to be different. Yeah. Even in our spiritual mindset, and strengths, and weaknesses, and preferences, and uh, the way we perceive our spiritual life, the way we perceive our, inter our relationship with God. Um, you know, hands and feet, eyes and ears. Okay, so how does this thing work? Uh, we've got these quadrants, you've got the diagram, you'll see at the top is M, mind, where's the laser pointer? Oh, it's not worth much, but okay. So right at the top you've got mind, that's the M. At the bottom you've got heart, that's H. Then you've got apophatic, which is A, and cataphatic, which is the K. Now, mind and heart, that's kind of fairly easy to understand, I don't think I need to explain that, we don't need a dictionary for that. I will be seriously impressed if someone can explain to me what apophatic and cataphatic means. Because I had no clue. I, I, I've never seen these words before in my life. Apophatic is uh, defining or knowing through negative, uh, my goodness, statements. That's the Cambridge Dictionary. Defining or, or, or knowing through negative statements. So basically, in the context of theology and God, says none of our concepts can properly be affirmed of God because he transcends all human concepts. 
So even if we say God is full of grace, the apophatic mindset says, no, that's a mystery because how can, it, it's uns- as humans, we cannot understand what it means to be completely full of grace. We can, we, we can only try and understand it, but we cannot really understand it. That's apophatic. Cataphatic is the opposite. It's defining or knowing through positive statements, Cambridge Dictionary. Theologically, it means our concepts can be affirmed of God, and he can be known, understood, and described. So these are obviously two extremes and opposites. But that's what apophatic and cataphatic mean. So apophatic is the mystery of God. God is completely mysterious. Cataphatic says God has completely revealed himself to us. We can know him. We can understand him. All right. Now, these combination letters, where you end up, it puts you in one of these quadrants. So KN, for example, then you're in that quadrant of between mind and cataphatic. And then the plus or minus kind of shows whether you're more towards the center, if it's a minus. If you're neutral, you're kind of in the middle. And if you're a plus, you're kind of heading towards the extreme of that range of the KM uh, spiritual type. KM, in its extreme, heads towards rationalism. And each one of these have an extreme where they head towards some kind of extreme, almost sectarianism. And we find that in over history that a lot of these extremes ended up in denominations and sects that they are known for this one thing. So KM is the top right quadrant. K, uh, KH is the, oh, we'll go clockwise, bottom right. Then if you're uh, uh, AH, you're bottom left. And if you are AM, you are top left. So Neither of this is not about better or worse, or this one is better or that one is worse. Uh, it is about how different we are. Now, the implications for unity is that sometimes, especially when we're on the extremes, if you have two pluses, for example, then it's something you should be very aware of that uh, that you should be careful about kind of extreme thinking, judgmental thoughts about those who are so different from you. That's the one thing which can cause disunity. Um, ideally, we should all aim to be balanced. But we shouldn't all, if we're all just in the middle, then we're all just the same. Uh, so there's you know, pluses and minuses. Basically, the body, the church as a body, needs all of these, all four quadrants to function and to fulfill its mission and function in the world. Briefly, some of the... Uh, so where did I end up? I ended up as a K, K minus H minus. Now what's interesting, that is where I am now. I suspect if I did this when I just became a Christian, almost uh, whatever, 30 years ago, then I, I probably would have been K plus M plus. Or, uh, yeah, probably, yeah, K plus M plus. I think if I did this survey 30 years ago when I became a Christian, I would have been Complete off the charts, K plus, M plus, score 11, 11, because everything to me was black and white. It was all about right and wrong. It's all very clear. You know, relationship is all just about, you know, conquering the world, spreading the gospel, converting people, and, you know, everything can be solved with that. And, uh, you know, faith is just about obedience and so on and so on. We can know everything, understand everything, and if we just all fall in line, life in church will be great. Over time, and part of this is about spiritual disciplines and reaching spiritual maturity, through practicing spiritual disciplines and growing and maturing, I got more centered. And I actually shifted even below the line from more mind-oriented than to slightly below the line, being more heart-oriented, which even surprised me a bit because I am I'm an engineer. I'm kind of scientific and very rational in my thinking. Um, I tend to teach fairly well. But uh, it's spiritual practices that kind of taught me and matured me to, to, to have a bit more heart and <laughs> to understand a bit more that, you know, there's a mystery part of God, some parts of God that I don't understand and that is not so clear and obvious. So that's me. Um, does anybody else want to share where they fell in and, and kind of what they think about it? I don't know, Liesl? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good 
You, wanna, you can, if you want to, you want to come up or? Okay, you stand up so people can hear you. Yeah. So, mine is a bit mystery to me as well. So, I didn't know me because I was often played the commentary and I really cared. And when I looked at it, I thought, no, 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 I made a mistake. This is not me. Because I thought I should be in the end phase, you know, the top right, because I'm a quantitative statistician by qualification. My work is all about numbers and trends and all of that. And I thought I approached God like that. But I ended up in the top left, the, the MA, and actually um, I'm an M minus and an A. So I'm towards the, the middle of the top left. And I, I actually think I had a turning point. A, a number of years ago, a lot of things in my life changed quite dramatically. And I moved from an MK to, to a, a MA. And I can actually see it now. I'm actually, I'm learning to little bit, you know, to understand myself a little bit better. So I have to, of course, be you know wary that I shouldn't go into the extreme side of this, the moralism. But I found that it became more about my life became a more more about you know justice and peace and revelation of God, and, and also that this mysterious part of God that I thought I'd nailed before, God was so revealed to me before. And now there's a mysterious side of God, you know, allowing things that that feel sometimes so different from what I would have expected. Um, yeah, so, so I was actually quite caught by surprise. And I think, as Stephen said, you, you move in, in this realm. You don't stay in this really one quadrant. Um, so that's a bit about myself. Thank you, Liesl. Um, just keeping an eye on the time. So let's share some more in the fellowship afterwards. I think we might make for some great conversations. Um, point is, if you're on the extremes, be very aware of that. Uh, and think about spiritual disciplines that can balance you and center you a bit more. Um, so what, yes. What do you mean by spiritual disciplines? So spiritual disciplines are, there's a whole collection of spiritual disciplines and maybe we, it'll be a good series for one time, but, but it's things that we practice spiritually that, that help to develop us. So, and there are different groups of spiritual disciplines and didn't prepare this, I'm trying to speak from memory, but for example, fasting is a spiritual discipline. Uh, solitude. Is a spiritual discipline. Like Malcolm, for example, I know once or three or four times a year, he takes two or three days where he goes, spends a, a spiritual retreat completely on his own. Solitude, that's a spiritual discipline. Um, evangelism is a spiritual discipline. Bible study is a spiritual discipline. Um, uh, practicing encouragement and fellowship is a spiritual discipline. So it's basically all the various aspects that, that helps us to mature and be complete as a Christian and uh, broaden our kind of uh, character spiritually. So those are some examples. Um, so very quickly, briefly, KN, cataphatic mind, it's about pursuing a knowable God by getting to know him. It's very intellectual. It's very much the Western approach for the last 500 years with the Enlightenment and rationalism and, and the philosophers and French philosophers and German philosophers and some Scottish and British philosophers kind of shaping that thinking, it easily exaggerates into rationalism. Um, cataphatic heart, God is knowable. We, we pursue him through change, personal change. Spirituality of personal, renewable, changing you know, myself. It's all about changing society, being very evangelistic. Um, you can solve all problems. You know, If everybody just becomes Christians, everything will be solved. We won't have any problems. In fact, if you just go out and share your faith, you'll solve your marriage problems, you'll solve your parenting problems, and life will just be great. Uh, just evangelize. Um, it exaggerates into pietism, like, you know, you know, just be holy and perfect, and, you know, life will be good. Apophatic mind says, well, we cannot go no, no God is unknowable, but we can pursue him at least through being obedient, you know, that, that mindset of obedience, stirred up by injustice, we need to take social action, Easily exaggerates into moralism and imposing our morals on the world around us, whether they believe it or not. Um, and in the apophatic heart is uh, God is unknowable. We need to pursue him through experiencing him. Spirituality is all about being inward directed, going to the mountaintop, isolate yourself. Evangelism is by attraction. You know, people will be attracted to this guru who sits on a mountain and know things. Um, it exaggerates into quietism, you know, mon mon monasticism, that, that kind of thing. All four of these can ex exaggerate into some very convincing kind of uh, forms of disunity. And if we think about those four quadrants, you know, if we think 
top left, moralism. I've heard some very convincing, convicting sermons from someone, for example, who leads, uh, who serves full time in Hope Worldwide, who basically says, you know, our, our ministry and our gospel is all about serving the poor. And if we will just serve the poor, people will naturally see that and be attracted to it and become Christians. It's very convincing. Can't argue with it. Then, top right, you've got the just evangelize the world and all will be good argument. Bottom right says, you know what, we actually need to take some time out and reflect and take a breather. We need to you know, build up spiritual capacity. Shepherding is important. We can't just convert people. We need to shepherd them and, and, and help them to develop and grow and actually get to know and understand God and so on and so on. So often preachers can preach in one of these directions and kind of to convince people that we all should be like that. And that's the main thing for us as a church. And that's what ends up causing disunity in churches sometimes. Uh, at a small scale between members in the church or at a grand scale because leaders proclaim this as this is what the church is all about. And churches do get known for that. The Quakers are known for quietism. They would, yeah, that's what they're known for. That kind of defines them. And so on. Okay. Um, Briefly, how do we apply this? Some things, some, what do we do with this? Proverbs 18 verse 2 says, Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. <coughs> the first step is not about, okay, it's not where I am. That's not the point. The point is understanding where others are and understanding how they're different from me. And that the fact that they're different doesn't mean that they're not Christians or they're lesser Christians or they have a lesser role in the body. Hands and feet, eyes and ears, K's and A's, H's and M's. Uh, personally, let's pursue balance. If you have a plus on one axis, be aware of exaggeration. Be careful of that. As a church, congregationally, strive to understand the opposites. Let go of judgmental attitudes of those who are so different from you. Some godly wisdom about extremes and balance. Actually, the, the Bible, I've just picked out some examples. The Bible is full of scriptures about avoiding extremes, getting balance. Um, Romans 10 verse 2. For I can uh, testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. He's talking about the Jews. And he says, you know what? They, they, their salvation is at risk because they're all zeal and lacking knowledge. Um, 1 Corinthians 8. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. You know? aware, be aware of the extreme of knowledge. It puffs up. You need to balance it with love. James what good, good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? How can such faith, faith save them? No? Faith without deeds. All faith, no deeds. All deeds, no faith, etc., etc. I'm going to skip through all the rest of these. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about speaking in tongues but lacking love. Gift of prophecy but no love. Mysteries, knowledge, no love. Giving up everything to the poor, no love. Unbalanced. It says you, you gain nothing, you are nothing, you're like a resounding gong symbol. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many claim to have unfailing love. Oh, I love God. I love people. But a faithful person who can find. It's easy to say, but can you live faithfully? There's loads more scriptures like this that warns us against being unbalanced in our spiritual development, in our perception, uh, going too strong towards one direction. So... Uh, uh, for our unity, it's important to understand these differences. It's important to embrace them and not try and expect others to be like me, but to accept that they're different. We have hands and feet, eyes and ears. But most importantly, as we have communion, it's actually what's mo most important is head, not hands, feet, eyes and ears. In Ephesians 4 verse 15, Paul writes and he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow, the church, will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As we have the communion, and uh, let's get our focus and our mind back on not the hands and feet that are different in the eyes and the ears, but on the head, which is Christ. Christ died for the unity of the church. He died and gave up his body and his life on the cross so that this body can be united. 
despite our differences. And he achieves that by helping us not to put our focus on each other, but to put our focus on him, on the head. As we have the, the bread, let's think about his broken body that was offered up and his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins so that our focus on that head, Christ, can be the thing that unites us. Let's pray for the, um, let's pray for the communion. Dear God, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son that unites us as Christians in all our differences, Father. Thank you for all the differences in the church. Thank you that uh, you've shown us that we need to be different so that we can function as a body, Father. Father, uh, we thank you for your forgiveness as we have this bread and the fruit of the vine. Please bless it in our bodies and please keep on forgiving our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.